Our guest for today's My Missouri Lecture is the Honorable Roy Blunt, United States Senator from Missouri and a fifth generation Missourian. Ironically, I first met Roy Blunt at an annual meeting of this organization in 1986. He was completing his second year as Secretary of State and my colleague Lawrence Christensen and I received the first Richard Brownlee Award and Secretary Blunt came up to congratulate us. Roughly one year later, then Secretary of State Blunt invited me to become the State Archivist of Missouri. And for the next four, few, four years, I worked closely with him, often traveling with him across and through the state that we both called home, the state whose history we both cherish. I have very fond memories of those often late night conversations as we traveled back to Jefferson City from yet another distant point in Missouri, including one very late night trip west on I-70 coming out of St. Louis. When distracted by our conversation, I missed the exit on Highway 54. Kingdom City. The secretary quickly reminded me of my mistake. Uh, Roy Blunt became more than my boss. He became my good friend. And through the years, I have watched and wondered at the time and energy and thought he has devoted to serving the residents of our great state. I've never known anyone who works harder or cares more about doing the right and good thing or Missourians than Roy Blunt. Roy Blunt has been in public life for so long, he may have forgotten what private life is like. As a young college student, he took a teaching job uh, teaching high school history in Marshville, Missouri. He was teaching there in 1972 when he volunteered to drive John Ashcroft around Southwest Missouri when Ashcroft was one, running an unsuccessful campaign to unseat Gene Taylor in Congress. I'm told that the only question Ashcroft asked Roy was whether his truck had gas in it. It did, and so Roy Blunt became Ashcroft's driver. The next year, Roy Blunt left his teaching position to become the county clerk of Greene County, appointed to fill an unexpired term by then Governor Christopher Bond. In 1980, he ran unsuccessfully for the office of Lieutenant Governor of the state, Four years later, he was elected Missouri's Secretary of State, replacing a political icon named Jimmy Kirkpatrick, who had held that position for two decades. In 1992, he ran for the office of governor, and he fought a hotly contested Republican primary against State Treasurer Wendell Bailey and Attorney General Bill Webster. And in the end, uh, Mel Carnahan was elected governor I spent a lot of time in the car with Roy during that campaign. Roy Blunt took a sabbatical from politics, sort of, uh, for a few years when he assumed the presidency of his alma mater, Southwest Missouri Baptist University in Bolivar in 1993. In 1996, upon the retirement of Missouri's seventh district congressman, Mel Hancock, he was elected to the first of seven consecutive terms in Congress where he quickly rose to a leadership position. In 2016 or 2010, in the wake of Senator Christopher Bond's retirement from the Senate, Roy Blunt was elected to replace him and reelected to the Senate in 2016, where he became one of his party's leaders in that body. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Missouri's senior senator and my good friend, the Honorable Roy Blunt. <clears throat> Thank you, Gary. Great introduction. And there was nothing I liked better when I was Secretary of State and I was going somewhere and say, you have time to ride with me and whoever was driving us uh, that day, particularly whoever was driving us after Gary missed the exit at <laughs> 11 o'clock at night and we had to add another 30 minutes to, uh, to that, day's, that day's drive. I would say, Coach Norm Stewart, that this morning when Gary was talking about your speech last year, the two terms I heard him use were legendary and lively. Today he talks about 
Creed Corps and de Tocqueville. So <laughs> when he's introducing me, if you'd rather read Creed Corps and de Tocqueville than Storm and Back, uh, you should stay. Otherwise, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to keep up with my good friend and one of my heroes, uh, Norm Stewart. Um, you know, I probably spent as much time in all parts of our state as anybody who's ever been elected to state office. One, I've done it long. I've done it a long time, and two, travel was. I had lots of travel options when I was doing it, but uh, I, I love our state. Let me spend about maybe the first four or five minutes just talking about what I think makes Missouri unique. And if you need more of that, you can look at the bicentennial history in the state manual that Jay Ashcroft asked me if I would write this year. But, you know, Missouri is in so many ways where the country comes together. It's where the East and the West come together and the North and the South come together. Uh, it, hap it reflects our entire history, I think, and our entire country in ways uh, that don't happen the same anywhere else. St. Louis is often described as the westernmost eastern city. Kansas City, I think, is different than St. Louis and much more like other big cities in the west and Midwest than St. Louis is. Springfield and Joplin are really more like northeast Arkansas and uh, north, northwest Arkansas and northeast Oklahoma much more reflective of that part of the country. The Delta, of course, very different, very much reflective of its uh, Delta, econ the Butio more like its Delta economic uh, heritage uh, and its Delta heritage generally. Um, North, Northern Missouri, where I was off and on most of the last three weeks, um, more like Iowa in a lot of ways. Um, I had a guy, one a guy who worked for me who years ago was we were driving in north, uh, northern, northern Missouri, maybe in Shelby County, but northern Missouri, and he said, you know, when I'm up here, I feel like I'm on top of the world, and I've always kind of had that top of the world feeling whenever I'm in northern Missouri, and I had it again this week when we're from Worth County, where I was at the Andrews Wool Company, I could I could see Iowa. Uh, no other state has more neighboring states than we do. And only one state, Tennessee, has as many. Uh, the Geographic Population Center of the United States has been where we live for 50 years, sort of traveling down I-44 or parallel to I-44 as the national population shifted more south and west, but for half a century in Missouri. Uh, the Census Department just in the last uh, month or so put up the plaque in Hartville, Missouri that said this is the population center of the United States from the 2020 census. Missouri sits in the middle of the biggest piece of contiguous agricultural land in the world. Uh, it's the only piece of agricultural land like it that has its own built-in transportation system. You know, there, are, there are more miles of navigable river. This is, a, this is a good thing to tell a bunch of people interested in history because you'll have to go home and check this. There are more miles of navigable river in the Mississippi River Valley than the rest of the world put together. More miles of river, lots of places, but not navigable river. You know, too hard to use the way we're able to use it. Uh, it's one of our great natural benefits. And the highways and the railroads that were built sort of in the shadow of, of those rivers in our state are very reflective of how we compete and frankly reflective of why people were so drawn to Missouri and how our economy developed from the 17th century until right now. I think we're at our best when we grow things and make things and mine things and move things around. I never see us as particularly good at giving advice because we're not particularly good at taking uh, advice. So a service economy, while an important part of what we do, isn't necessarily what we're best at. 
but this is a good time for what we're best at, growing things, making things, mining things. You know, world food demand is about to change dramatically. It'll like will double from 2010 to 2060. All this new concern about the supply chain and nearshoring and friendshoring and onshoring, all couldn't be, we couldn't be better positioned for all of any of that. Our research institutions have made life-changing discoveries in agriculture and health and science. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, with vigorous uh, help from the members of the Congress in both Kansas and Missouri, just moved almost all of their ag research jobs uh, to Kansas City in 2019. Uh, the University of Missouri, Washington University, Missouri State, St. Louis University consistently get grants from the National Institute of Health. And in a report, Dr. Moon Choi, I just read uh, recently what we're seeing happen at the new research facility here, very reflective of more and more research uh, researchers, which will be followed by more and more research scientists as we look at how rapidly health is changing. Missouri will be and has been part of that. Um, lots of inventors came from Missouri. James Ferguson created the liquid crystal display, the LCD light. Uh, Jack Kilby invented the microchip, two Missourians who did that. Another one, Bill Lear, created the first mass-produced business jet. George Washington Carver found new ways to do things with food that nobody had thought of how to both raise it, process it, and use it. Then he had Edwin Hubble from Webster County, the Hubble telescope which was pretty amazing until we got to the, the telescope that's up there now, but that wouldn't be up there without the tele Hubble telescope, which got us for the first time beyond the Milky Way. Jack Dorsey, a little more argumentative here because a little more local, you know, founded Square, that little box that merchants all over America can suddenly get keyed into the whole credit system uh, of the world in the United States and co-founded Twitter, which at least as of last week looked like it was a pretty good thing to have done for $144 billion. Uh, innovators like uh, J.C. Penney and Sam Walton and Johnny Morris created new ways to figure out how to market and merchandise and the J.C. Penney stores, which were revolutionary at the time, and Walmart, which got Missouri was the first place Walmart came after Northwest Arkansas, uh, but Sam Walton came from Missouri before he went to Northwest Arkansas. Uh, Johnny Morris, the Bass Pro Shops, you know, that long list of things. Uh, Mr. Hall, J.C. Hall, who founded Hallmark, and James McDonald became an aviation a pioneer. We are a people that have always sought out change. Our political leaders like Lenore Sullivan and Virginia Minor and Annie White Baxter, Bill Clay, Champ Clark, Stuart Symington helped change Missouri and America in the 19th and 20th century. No new president, and I was able to say something like this a month ago when we put the Truman statue in the rotunda of the Capitol, no, two, no, no new president made more consequential decisions than Harry Truman the first six months he was president. And his willingness to make them high school graduate, incredible common sense, uh, read everything according to him at the Independence Library, uh, really stood him in good stead and he was willing to make decisions. Sometimes the worst decision you can make is not making a decision and he was willing to make decisions. Uh, and those decisions have ranked him now among some of the best presidents the last 50 years. Uh, Jack Danforth, Phyllis Schlafly, Ike Skelton, Tom Eagleton, Kit Bond, Claire McCaskill, Richard Gephardt, John Ashcroft, all figures in our great national debate. So that last 50 years I'd like to talk about for a little while today. 25% of 
the, uh, our state's history and 100% of my political life. 1972, Kit Bond was elected Missouri's first Republican governor in a generation and the first Republican governor in, in my lifetime. As it turned out, the biggest new development for me and for people who were already serving in county office was for the first time ever Republican county officials had an opportunity to leave, ever might be a stretch, for the first time in a long time, uh, Republican county officials had an opportunity to leave, and with few exceptions, they'd be replaced by a Republican governor. Uh, Ted Willis, the Greene County clerk in Springfield, announced almost immediately that he was going to take advantage of having a governor from his political party for the first time in the 26 years he'd held the county clerk and chief election authorities job and announced that he'd be leaving office whenever Governor Bond had selected his replacement. It was expected, of course, that that person would run for the office in 1974 and have some experience whenever they did that two years later. Governor Bond decided he was going to do something different than, I think he pledged this during the campaign, he was going to rely on the local party committees to make recommendations about filling vacancies. Uh, and so the 100 plus Greene County Republican Central Committee was going to decide who had this job that hadn't been open for uh, 26 years. There were about half a dozen competitors. One of them was Governor Bond's county coordinator in the election that he had just won, with Springfield being a really helpful part of winning that election. One of my uncles said I was the only one of those competitors who, had, who didn't understand that I had no chance of being chosen for that job. So as Gary mentioned, I'm teaching American history and government at Marshfield High School after finishing my master's degree at what's now Missouri State University. I'd helped John Ashcroft in that unsuccessful campaign for Congress in 1972 and then volunteered to help Gene Taylor, who by 1973 was starting his 16 year uh, congressional career. So that was pretty much the subtotal of my political experience right there. But it's better than not having had any political experience at all when I began to talk to those uh, county committee members. I just turned 23 and for at least the first year, it was almost like I had a number in addition to my name. 23 year old county clerk Roy Blunt today did this or that. Uh, but with, you know, a job uh, with responsibility for all elections in what was then Missouri's third most pop biggest county by population and lots of deadlines to announce and significant administrative responsibilities still in that job, the, working for the county court, which now we call the county commission. And along with duties like I was, I've handled all of the things that the county superintendent of schools had handled when we had one, and they'd eliminated that job about 10 years earlier. And most importantly for me, a very competitive local media. So every single day of the work week, local reporters came to the courthouse in a pack that included at least three radio reporters one or more of the reporters from the three television stations, uh, at least one newspaper reporter, and they were counting on the courthouse and Springfield City Hall to fill lots of the daily news space. The county sheriff, former Cardinals catcher Mickey Owen and I, somehow seemed to be the two people that figured out how to take the most advantage of the fact that we had press in our office every single day. I have a hard time imagining how I'd be here today if it hadn't been for a competitive news uh, environment and being in one of Missouri's most efficient media markets, a big media market where almost everybody that watched whatever you talked about the three or four days a week, you figured out how to be on either television, the radio, or in the newspaper, were all Missourians. Now that was all good, but for that, for that to really work for me, I first had to get elected. 
I was sworn in as county clerk at almost exactly the same time that John Dean, the White House counsel, went to the federal investigators who were looking into Watergate uh, and the Watergate cover-up. The year before, a Green County, County grand jury had been in panels to investigate county government, uh, and those two topics really did consume the 1974 election year to the point that I was the only Republican candidate with opposition who won a county-wide office in Greene County that year. Uh, and that election being 24 and new to politics was a good thing. I'd later served with uh, North Carolina Secretary of State Thad Ure, who was the longest serving statewide elected official in the history of the country in, the, in one job. Uh, he, was, um, he retired in 1989 when he first ran the first time in 1936. His slogan was, give a young man a chance. When he ran the last time in 1984, his slogan was, experience counts. <laughs> Certainly in 1974, I was way on the give a young man a chance side of that equation. By the last time I ran, I was probably talking about experience counts, somewhere that everybody winds up. So in 1974, I was the first Republican elected to be Missouri's Secretary of State in 52 years. So when I ran for Lieutenant Governor in 1980, my plan at the time, and in 1980, Wally Pfeffer, who was here, was running for Secretary of State. My plan at the time was I really wanted to be Secretary of State. I was sure I couldn't beat Mr. Kirkpatrick, and I was probably sure that winning a statewide office the first time out as a Republican in 1980, really hard to do, but if I could get close enough, and if Mr. Kirkpatrick would decide not to run, I'd be exactly where I wanted to be in 1984. That's actually my longest plan in politics ever, uh, and it happened to work out. But like, any, like every successful statewide Republican candidate, in our state at that time, I, I campaigned as the person you'd hire to do the job who happened to be a Republican. You know, if you want to be the first person from your party elected to some job in 50 years, you don't start with saying, you want to vote for me because I'm a Republican, because they'd apparently figured out how to not to do that, a majority of voters, for five decades. Uh, why would you want to be in that pattern? And frankly, I think that has uh, defined a lot of my politics, much more focused in talking about what you want to do and then hopefully being able to talk about how you got it done or how much of it you were able to get done rather than just running. When I was uh, elected to the House, I was in the House leadership pretty quickly. I was in the Senate leadership the first year, which is a, a side. Um, but I was elected to the House leadership pretty quickly. And immediately, I realized that I was the only person at the leadership table on our side who winning the Republican primary had not always been good enough to have want to win the general. And it made a difference in the way I looked at almost everything compared to the way my colleagues looked at everything because they were much more primary election focused and I was much more general election focused. Does this still work when you're trying to put a combination of people together who aren't automatically on your side? Now, I will say in 1984, it didn't hurt that Ronald Reagan was running for re-election and you know, ran well in our state as he did the whole country. But being in the right place at the right time is a pretty big part of politics. And frankly, I think it's a pretty big part of life. Being prepared when you're at the right place at the right time is really helpful, uh, but right place at right time really matters so much in the things that happen in life. Uh, again, I'd say, you know, an active state media uh, was a big part of my Secretary of State's campaign, and generally after that, but certainly then, I was, I was endorsed by 
Part of that was the 1980 introduction, but I, I was endorsed by every newspaper that made an endorsement in the Secretary of State's race, uh, except for one, my opponent's hometown paper, the Hannibal Courier Post, and uh, earned media and volunteer activity were our two biggest concepts in, in winning that campaign. Now, since 1932, the ultimate winner of the Secretary of State's race had been decided in the Democratic primary. Since 1964, that person had been James C. Kirkpatrick. And I really had done, as the county clerk and chief election authority in the third biggest county and the only one without a, all the bigger counties had a board of election commissioners, I really had done more of what the Secretary of State did every day for 12 years than any other elected official in Missouri. And because of that, Mr. Kirkpatrick and I were and continue to be good friends. In fact, the only other editorial that the Hannibal newspaper ran in that election about the Secretary of State's race uh, was an editorial criticizing Mr. Kirkpatrick, who went about a month after the primary before he decided that as a Democrat statewide elected official, he was going to endorse the Democrat candidate. But prior to that, he was, well, may, I think maybe I'll just stay out of this. So, you know, the two good candidates. So he called me one day and said, Roy, I think he said, my friends are telling me that it's really helpful to you that I'm not endorsing the Democrat. And I said, well, Jim, they're right. <laughs> it, it is really helpful to me that you're not endorsing the Democrat. And if you think that that's, you do whatever you think you need to do, I'd love for you to keep the current view you have, but I'd understand if you don't. And he, he did endorse my opponent, who's a good guy, Gary Sharp, maybe the last statewide campaign where nobody said anything bad about the other candidate. We did have one debate at Lindenwood College, and Charles Osgood from uh, radio, TV also, but more on radio, picked up on that, and, and he loved the debate of Blunt versus Sharp. <laughs> and you, you can imagine, and Sharp's opponent in the primary was a guy named Jack Keene. So everybody had a last name that you could use any way you wanted to, but Charles Osgood loved the Blunt versus Sharp uh, debate. Fortunately, if Blunt didn't, whether Blunt won the debate, I don't know, but election day worked out fine. So on my first visit to the office after the election, and I was, I was mostly there to tell that big staff of a couple hundred people in the Secretary of State's office, I'm gonna change about 10 people. I think I had them all together, so I'm gonna change about 10 people at the management level at the office. But if you're here and you're doing a good job, you should enjoy Thanksgiving and enjoy Christmas, and we're gonna be working together uh, in January. And on that visit, Mr. Kirkpatrick asked me how much money I'd spent in the campaign. I told him I'd raised and spent $300,000. I mentioned this to one of our statewide future candidates the other day who almost passed out. Who, you know, now I think it's not unreasonable to ask one donor to put $300,000 in your special pack of some kind that I've never, we never didn't have that when I was running. By the time I'd raised and spent $300,000, he said he'd never spent more than $30,000. I don't know what to say, Wally. He never spent, well, he, he remembered it as 30. He'd never spent more than $30,000 in any of his five successful campaigns. And I quickly told him I wasn't surprised that I was at least 10 times as hard to elect as he had ever been. Uh, again, I had a chance to be the first new person in a job in two decades, and I, I made the most of it. But I also kept a note. I, we, I had a great relationship with Mr. Kirkpatrick. When I ran for Congress several years later, he wrote a $1,000 check. And I'm sure he'd never written one to anybody before, and certainly not a Republican before. But I kept a notepad on the side of my desk, wanted to call and just periodically check in and ask for his advice on something. And another, if I was going to make a change, to call and talk to him about it, tell him I was getting ready to make it. And on every one of those changes, I always figured out how to explain how 
making this decision any time earlier than now would have probably been a mistake because the technology or the whatever was not available yet. And I thought he deserved that respect, and I gave it to him. Um, while I was serving as Secretary of State, Bob Pretty, who's here from the Missouri Net, and I worked together to establish a still unofficial at the time, but much more effective election night reporting system. And Bob and I were talking about that uh, even today, where everything was kind of haphazard and not put together, but we put our efforts at the Secretary of State's office in line with the Missouri Net and the Associated Press and the Missouri Press Association, which had always had a big uh, relationship with the Secretary of State's office. Doug Cruz, who's here, was an important part of that. And Bob uh, Pretty and Doug Cruz and I uh, would continue to work together on a lot of things for a long time after that, one of which was advocating for a, an appropriate building for the State Historic Society of Missouri and its incredible collection that's been talked about already today. In my first term as Secretary of State, Governor Ashcroft asked me to co-chair the Missouri Opportunity 2000 Commission with former St. Louis Mayor John Pelker. Uh, I think our recommendations were a good blueprint. It's a little surprising how far we are from 2000 already at 2022. Many of them dealt with education and when that was over, the governor asked me to chair a governor's advisory council on literacy with Education Commissioner Bob Bartman. I also began to work with the legislature to build a new building for the Secretary of State's office. Uh, the Missouri Senate and House Appropriation Chairman, that was Ed Dirk in the Senate, Senator Ed Dirk and Marvin Proffer and I got in a plane with the designer for the building, the potential designer for the building. They were both Democrats. We went to some presidential libraries and a couple of archives facilities to talk about the building and how to move forward. Uh, the focal points on that building, the new State Information Center, now the Kirkpatrick Information Center, were the State Archives and the State Library. Um, that building made it possible to move the offices we had in the Truman Building out of the Truman Building and free that space off, and more importantly, got us out of rented warehouse space for uh, the uh, State Records Center and the archives to space where they really deserve to be. Gary uh, was the uh, archivist, uh, state archivist, when we designed Gary Kramer, when we designed the building. Uh, I think that pretty good practice for designing this great building, having put that building together as Gary and I worked on together to do. And then Ken Wynn followed him in that job uh, and moved forward with the archives and Missouri's unique local records program that we were also able to create while I was Secretary of State. After losing the campaign for governor, primary campaign for governor in 1992, I went back to Southwest Baptist University where I'd gotten my undergraduate degree I'd been the first person in my family to graduate from college, and it was great to spend the next four years at SBU. We had a really good nationally ranked debate team, good music and theater. We were the only private school coach in the MIAA, so we played all the Division II schools in Missouri and Kansas. And with the exception of the days we played uh, the, the Bearcats from Northwest Missouri State, or the gorillas from Pittsburgh on football, we did pretty well. But those two days were always days no college president would want, want to witness, but uh, I did. Our healthcare programs grew at the time. Our graduate programs grew. The 80-year-old St. John's School of Nursing in Springfield became part of the university. Uh, and we restarted a physical therapy program that today graduates and anticipates around 80 new doctors in physical therapy every year. Uh, when we did the bishop, um, when we uh, made the decision on the nursing school, the bishop of Springfield, Cape Girardeau, and I had developed a great relationship. And when I publicly joked when we announced this that I was thinking we should change the name uh, from the St. John School of Nursing to the St. John the Baptist School of Nursing, <laughs> he he at least smiled, and <laughs> we didn't we didn't change the name to the St. John's the Baptist. Now, later, I was joking with my uh, 
college and university president friends when I told them early in 1996 that I was going to get out of politics and run for Congress. <laughs> I did run for Congress. Republicans were in the majority for the first time in four decades. And uh, 7th District Congressman Mel Hancock decided not to run. So I went to Congress in January of 1997 and 26 years and almost 13,000 votes later. You should really think about that for a while before you want to go publicly on record with 13,000 decisions. 13,000 votes later, I'll be leaving the Senate on January the 3rd. When I announced I wouldn't be running again in March of 2021, and I was standing outside the dairy barn on our family farm, I said one of the le lessons I learned there was to finish strong, and I intended to do just that. In maybe an, a past way of looking at this, but my way of looking, I've had events in all, all 114 counties in the city of St. Louis since I announced I wasn't running again. Uh, and it ends decades of traveling all over the state. I've been constantly and once again reminded of the diversity and the determination of Missourians. I was at the Knox County High School just a few weeks ago talking to students that were, uh, their project was to figure out how to market products with the Knox County Eagle logo on those uh, products. Another group of students there were retrofitting a delivery truck to allow the store to move to the football field or to the annual corn festival a few miles away or wherever they thought there was a market uh, for Knox County Eagle products. Sullivan County was the site of an 11 county water reservoir dedication that leaders and voters in those counties had been working on since 1988. You know, so much of the country is now concerned about the huge water problem shortage we're facing. People in Missouri's north central border saw it coming and began working on that project almost four decades ago. Uh, Missourians are looking for new ways to do new things and new ways to do old things. One family I visited not too long ago was raising thousands of gourds is still thousands of gourds to ship to Asia. I've been to catfish farms and koi fish farms in our state. Missouri's leading areas like ag research, plant science, health research, geospatial technology, all of those things are producing real results, but we're well positioned to do lots of things, more resilient plants, healthier food, advances in personalized medicine, cutting edge, edge, uh, cutting edge ways to fight cancer and Alzheimer's. Our state has new and unlimited opportunities in data, geo, the geospatial economy, advanced manufacturing and telecom. It's an exciting time for Missourians who were born here or have moved here and Missourians have always been e uh, e eager to reach for the future and be part of it. So I'm grateful. I'm grateful that Missourians have allowed me to be part of their lives and to work for them. Uh, by the time I had my last statewide campaign in some counties, my, I was using the third generation of a family, the same family to be my county coordinators. Uh, people have stuck with me and I hope I've stuck with them. I'm grateful for the friends we've had, grateful for great staff, and nobody's had better staff, um, and a family who was willing to put up with all of this, and who's embraced Missouri and what Missouri is all about, as I've had a chance to do. Thank you for letting me work for you, and thank you for letting me be here today.